Lujan versus Defenders of Wildlife is considered to be the leading post-data processor's case on standing doctrine as of now. The case has to do with certain endangered species, like the Nile crocodile. The complaint in Lujan alleges that the Nile crocodile faces extinction because of the impact of the Aswan High Dam, built in part with U.S. aid funds. The complaint also alleges that the Sri Lankan leopard and the Asian elephant are endangered by the Mahaweli Dam in Sri Lanka, also funded in part by U.S. aid dollars. If a federal agency were to fund any such project anywhere in the U.S. or on the high seas, it would be required under the Endangered Species Act to consult first with the Department of the Interior to determine whether the project would violate the Act's mandates. The agency funding the Mahaweli and Aswan High Dams was the USAID, U.S. Agency for International Development. The USAID did not consult with Interior about the impact of these projects on endangered species. The agency action complained of is a rule promulgated by the Secretary of Interior to reverse the agency's earlier interpretation of the ESA. In 1978, Interior interpreted the ESA as governing agency actions wherever in the world they might endanger species. In 1986, the agency reversed itself and declared that Congress did not intend the ESA to have extraterritorial reach onto but not beyond the high seas. A significant legal issue. Suppose, though, that Interior had it right the first time and that the reinterpretation was not even within the reasonable range at Chevron Step 2. How is this alleged illegality to be fixed? In the UK, courts will entertain suits by parties who they judge will faithfully represent an important public interest. If the Lujan case had arisen in the United Kingdom under UK law, then the defenders of wildlife would likely have been able to have gotten judicial review without having to go through the rigmarole of swearing to having bought non-refundable airline tickets to, say, war-torn Sri Lanka. But the USA is different. Although it doesn't say so itself, our Constitution has long been interpreted as defending only individual rights. Dr. Seuss's The Lorax, if human, might have standing to speak for himself, but not for the trees. Who are the parties seeking judicial review in Lujan? Amy Skilbred and Joyce Kelly say that the dam projects in Egypt and Sri Lanka will likely make it impossible for them to study the Nile crocodile, the Asian elephant, and the Sri Lankan leopard. They have brought suit individually and as members of the Defenders of Wildlife against the Secretary of the Interior. The agency has, nothing, has done nothing directly to regulate, limit, or set back the interests of Skilbret and Kelly, but they asked the court to set aside Interior's rule interpreting the ESA as not reaching what is happening in Sri Lanka and Egypt. Were it not for Interior's action, the USAID would have to consult with Interior about whether funding the dams would further threaten the already endangered species. And as a result, the USAID would impose conditions on the aid it provides to dam projects abroad to mitigate the danger to species. We can recognize the same general pattern we saw in data processors. In Lujan, the court summarizes and further elaborates its doctrine of standing. Over the years, our cases have established that the irreducible constitutional minimum of standing contains three elements. To say that there is a constitutional minimum implies that nothing Congress can do will remove or alter these elements. Only a constitutional amendment will do. What are these elements? First, the plaintiff must show an injury in fact, an invasion of a legally protected interest. The interest may be economic, as in data processors, or it might be aesthetic, religious, recreational, or conservational. The court attempts no limit 
to the kinds of interests the law might protect. Defenders have alleged an injury, in fact, but the invasion of that legal interest must be concrete and particularized. This is where Skillbred and Kelly come in. In an earlier case, the Sierra Club had alleged that the Forest Service's illegal approval of a Disney resort in the Sierras would injure its members' recreational and aesthetic interests. But the Sierra Club was held not to have alleged that any of its members actually used the federal lands at issue. The Sierra Club was denied standing. Further cases established that associational standing depends upon an association's members being themselves as individuals among the injured. But this is not yet enough. The injury must be actual or imminent, not conjectural. It would be absurd to insist that an injury have already occurred before a plaintiff had standing to sue to prevent it. So proving an imminent injury suffices, but it cannot be merely hypothetical. The court in Lujan denies standing because the Skillbred and Kelly affidavits do not allege what the court is willing to consider an imminent injury. The dissent objects to the majority's imposing a formalistic pleading requirement, which in this case presumably might have been satisfied by buying the airline tickets. But let's come back to that. What else does the Constitution require in addition to injury in fact? Second, there must be a causal connection between the agency action and the injury. The injury has to be fairly traceable to the challenged action and not the result of the independent action of some third party. The court cites its ECRO case, Simon v. Eastern Kentucky Welfare Rights Organization. In ECRO, the indigent plaintiffs challenged the IRS's rule allowing hospitals to drop indigent care as a condition of qualifying for favorable tax status. The court acknowledged that the indigent plaintiffs alleged an injury in fact, but it dismissed the plaintiffs for lack of standing anyway. The hospitals that discontinued indigent, indigent care might have had other reasons for doing so, other than the incentive of being able to cut costs without losing tax benefits. Unlike data processors, where the court was satisfied that banks would compete with non-bank data processors if permitted to do so, and unlike Clark versus Security Industries Association, where the court assumed that the entry of banks into the security selling business was causally connected to the agencies allowing them to do so. Another aspect of causation is our third element, redressability. It must be likely, as opposed to merely speculative, that the injury is redressable by a favorable decision. In data processors and Clark, it was clear that a judicial ruling would put an end to banks engaging in non-banking businesses. In ECRO, the court found it merely speculative of the plaintiffs to allege that the hospitals would continue or reinstate indigent services. The ECRO plaintiffs were not allowed an opportunity to show that some or all of the hospitals would have decisive economic incentives to keep their tax exemption. In Lujan itself, a plurality of the court doubted that the defenders could satisfy the redressability element. The USAID might decide to continue funding the dam projects after consulting with Interior, and Egypt and Sri Lanka might get funding elsewhere if USAID cut off the aid. From Lujan, we can distill the following. In a nutshell, the irreducible constitutional minimum, injury in fact, traceability, redressability. But we must never forget that it's one thing to put it in a nutshell and another to keep it there. For example, if a plaintiff asserts a concrete injury and a denial of a procedural right of some kind, say, a statutory right to make an appearance in a hearing, then the immediacy and redressability prongs are relaxed. Another example, a plaintiff who owns property that might be affected by the construction of a dam has standing to demand that an environmental impact statement be prepared as a condition of agency approval. This procedural right does not require a showing that the dam will certainly be built 
or that the dam would not be built if the environmental impact statement were prepared. Moreover, the states of the United States receive a certain deference when they seek judicial review. In Massachusetts versus EPA, for example, the state was found to have standing to challenge the EPA's failure to regulate greenhouse gases. The injury, in fact, was the loss of coastline due to ocean levels rising, due in turn to global warming, due in turn to greenhouse gas emissions, due in turn to the EPA's failure to rulemake. As Justice Kennedy, concurring, wrote, Congress has the power to define injuries and articulate chains of causation that will give rise to a case or controversy where none existed before. This can make for a messy jurisprudence. Our own Professor Eric Siegel has written, soft or intangible factors often affect standing decisions, especially in highly politicized cases. Standing is the world's spongiest legal doctrine. Statutes can make it easier for plaintiffs to satisfy the causal elements, traceability and redressability. But the court has insisted with some consistency that the requirement of injury in fact is a hard floor of Article III jurisdiction that cannot be removed by statute. In Lujan, the court rejected the argument that the Endangered Species Act's citizen suit provision defines an interest in legality such that agency illegality amounts to an injury in fact suffered by all citizens. Citizen suit provisions can satisfy the zone of interests tests but agency illegality alone cannot constitute a generalized injury in fact. The court warns that the separation of powers would be undermined if Congress had the power to vest the executive power in private parties. Consider the following hypothetical statute. Good Government Act. Any person may commence a civil suit on his own behalf to enjoin any person, including the United States, and any federal government agency who is alleged to be in violation, in violation of any statutorily prescribed procedure under any law of the United States. The Good Government Act hypothesized here would erode the president's role as the executive charged with the responsibility to see that the laws are faithfully executed. Although Congress has the power to define novel injuries of a more specific sort, as in the case of environmental pollution, it cannot make illegal act agency action all by itself an injury, in fact, for Article III purposes. The sponge stops here. <laughs>